David Williams, a former boss of mine, actually. Uh, if we go back a, a little while with the Executive Magazine, but David, that was a that's a lifetime ago. What are you What are you up to at the moment? It's about thirty five years ago. Alec, the Executive, formed to block Leadership Magazine. I remember you did a story on APSA. Uh, Pete Bardenhorst of APSA was the, the person you talked about. Yeah, I look. Uh, I, Philip Frame. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember. You know, it, and it just it just shows what a what a great publication you ran there because I still remember a number of those mm. uh, articles that I wrote back then. But as you say, it's in ancient I, history. I remember now, our today, cover for Philip Frame was he's dead, but he won't lie down, which uh, upset a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> the Frame Group. Yeah, so Alec, I, I'm a former deputy editor, Financial Mail. I still I write write leading articles for them. I'm a teacher, trainer, a broadcaster still, doing books. So rather like you, keep my hand in in a lot of things. Something that I came across that you wrote recently was for the for the Brenthurst Foundation uh, on passenger rail, the passenger rail service. And I, I'm, I'm fascinated. It's a really good uh, paper that you put together. Uh, I'm fascinated to, to talk to you about that in more detail, given what's going on there at the moment with Mr. Jose Matthews. How do you get commissioned to do something like this? What's the real purpose of putting a, 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 a research a paper together like that? Well, I, th I think like you, Alec, I've been fortunate in my work to be able to follow my interests. So as a journalist, for most of my career at Financial Mail, I was able to take an interest in railways because it's an interest of mine. Um, education and the military are another two interests and politics, elections in particular, uh, I, I used to, I was able to explore. So I, I suppose I've got a bit of a name as someone who knows about railways and my friends know. And Greg Mills of the foundation, the director of the Brenthurst Foundation, he was driving to Cape Town. And he, when he got back, he said to me, I didn't see a train uh, the whole way, driving through the Karoo where the train goes alongside the road for many, many kilometers. He said, why are there no trains? Why are there so many trucks on the road and not enough trains? And, and the answer is a big one. When I started researching this report, I, I, I got about 15,000 words and they wanted 7,500. And it was difficult to cut down. But of course, that's the great discipline of journalism, which incidentally, in the age of uh, online, I think there's a, a lack of discipline with some writing because you can go on forever. <laughs> there's no space constraint, which is actually a discipline that you need. But essentially, I set out to answer that question. And there's a range, and we can talk about each of these, Alec. It's a perfect storm, as that now cliche phrase goes. There's a governance problem. There's corruption issues. There's policy issues. In other words, splitting uh, passenger rail from uh, freight rail as a matter of policy. Why did they do that and the effects that that's had? The lack of security, the lawlessness, the theft of... Uh, railway in infrastructure, the loss of market share. Now, everyone says, oh, well, they'll fix the trains and the passengers will come back. Well, not so easy because uh, the taxis and the buses and whatever else people use to get to work, that will in due course take the place of the trains. At the moment, there are no suburban trains running or very, very few in the country. And that's down from millions of passenger journeys 10, 15 years ago. It is a complete disaster. It's the equivalent of the lights being out. If you're looking at Eskom, to the transport sector, the rail transport sector, it's as if load shedding is there all the time. So there are different so, aspects. And, and as, yep. mm, as something that's not affecting the um, the writing classes or the broadcast or the media, Correct. Uh, there are not too many media people who get on a train. So as a consequence, they wouldn't. It wouldn't be that important to them, and it, it just seems to have been completely off the radar of the public discourse until this past week, when Jose Matthews was uh, placed on gardening leave as the head of Praza, mm. and now we discover he was brought in there earlier this year to fix the place, mm. but he now appears to have perhaps bumped into issues that are going to prevent him from ever fixing the place. Uh, the, maybe we can start on that story on the first part. Mm. I was under the impression that a state-owned enterprise fell under Pravin Gordon, but was this abused of that idea uh, by the fact that this doesn't, in fact, uh, uh, public uh, or rather the passenger rail agency 
falls under the Minister of Transport, which seems rather strange. Well, the first, <laughs> there's a question behind your question, that is, why is there a Department of Public Enterprises? I mean, ESCOM could arguably be allocated to energy. Uh, all the railways and airways and everything should be allocated to transport. So there's no reason for the Department of Public Enterprises, except that there is a department. But in the rail sector, the problem is, and this happened in the early 2000s, I think not with the best of intentions, with probably advice from fancy expensive consultants from England, they separated the passenger rail from the freight rail. So Transnet Freight Rail became a separate entity which reports to the Minister of Public Enterprises, Transnet. And PRASA, or before it was called the Commuter Rail Corporation, reports to the Minister of Transport. So before we even start, there is a clash there because in many cases they use the same track, they use the same equipment. Uh, it, it was a built integrated system and it was split. So that's the first problem. There's a governance problem. And I know from my contacts with some of the engineers who are trying to fix what's gone wrong, there is very little communication between Prasa and Transnet. Another um, senior person within the organization has said everyone in Transnet he's talking about, I think the same applies to Prasa, is terrified to do anything. They've had two or three layers of experience taken off, partly because of hunting down corruption and partly because everything's been sort of washed out with the corruption clean out. And managers sit in offices, not sure what to do, inexperienced and unable to take decisions. So you don't have to be corrupt to be incompetent. Uh, and it's simply a question of the way things are managed. To talk about Mr. Matthews, he's a, a struggle, it comes from a struggle family, uh, big good cr credentials, I think in the broad sense well qualified. What he knew or knows about railways and passenger railways is not clear to me. But, and I'm not saying therefore he is a, not the person for the job, but they have now suspended him on the grounds that he has dual citizenship with the UK. And that's apparently a function of when he was in exile, he took British citizenship. And that this was described as a security risk. And Alec, you want to say, do you think we are stupid? Just because he has two passports, he's become a security risk to passenger rail in South Africa. What can this mean? So immediately you say, what's behind this? They're trying to nail him for something else, but they can't. So again, as you say, the, the, the media classes, the chattering classes don't take much interest in this because they do not generally travel by train. It's the poor who travel by commuter trains. Didn't used to be. Middle class used to travel. Uh, now it's the poor, the people who can't afford anything else or have no other transport. So now this is another crippling blow to Prasa. They've had something like 10 chief executives in 12 years, mostly acting appointments. No one can do anything. Uh, so, Mr. Matthews, whatever his qualifications, he seems to have been suspended on spurious grounds. Maybe uh, he's done something which has upset people. Maybe he has done something he shouldn't have done genuinely, and they're trying to get him out. But it just is a symptom of a badly governed, badly organized, poorly stewarded, in terms of policy, organization. And it is a wreck. This company is a wreck. If it was a private sector company, it would be beyond business rescue. It would just simply not be functioning. So, David, what happens next? Or what well, is the, 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 the most logical thing that Cyril should be doing with this? Well, the first thing is you've got to secure your infrastructure. And one of the problems here is that and it goes, people say, oh, the ANC government has wrecked the railways. It's not the case. This started back in the 1970s when the road transport sector was deregulated without thought of how do we keep the right traffic on the rails. Uh, again, poor governance. And this is the old National Party uh, doing things. Again, not necessarily with bad intentions, uh, but with bad effects. So what's happened is we've got uh, the Railway Police, which was an institution of some 16,000 people, men and women, who they used to guard this massive infrastructure, patrol, arrest, convict, and so on. Under the, the P.W. Boerter government, they were short of police, South African police, and they amalgamated the Railways Police with the South African Police. 
And the result was that the railways were no longer policed. And it didn't take long for the criminal syndicates to realize that there was all this juicy infrastructure just waiting to be stolen or vandalized or wrecked, which is what's happened particularly in the last 20 years. Alec, if you go around uh, Gauteng, there are 480 kilometers approximately of suburban railway line. That's the passenger railway line. Almost all of that, the overhead equipment, the electrical wires that feed the current to the locomotives, is gone. Most of the suburban stations look like bomb sites, except the rubble has been removed. Uh, stations look as if they have been dug up uh, for some other purpose. In Cape Town, there are 2,000 uh, 2, people approximately living on the tracks. And Prasa can't get them off the tracks despite court orders so that they can start running trains again. Just to talk about the overhead equipment, the electrical overhead equipment, OHE as they call it in the business, it's just gone, most of it. Uh, it's going to cost at least half a million rand per kilometer to restore it. Now, that's just the overhead wires, not the station infrastructure, not the fences. There's a whole lot more. Now, the Minister of Transport, uh, Fakili and Bruder, they talk about fixing things by next year. I, I cannot see just on the back of a cigarette box, if you look at what has to be done, how they can possibly do it by next year. One engineer I spoke to said if they had one team working on this, it would take 15 years to fix throughout the country. Now, he says, obviously, they're going to try and have more teams than that. But there's a lot of money that has to be spent just to get things back to where they were before. Meanwhile, all the carriages have been sitting in the, in the yards, rusting, not looked after, not maintained. The tracks, track needs to be maintained. They're like roads. If the ballast gets silted up, washaways will wash the track away. In many places, we are one of the very few countries in the world where the gangs actually steal railway lines, uh, not just equipment around the railway lines, but the railway lines themselves. So there's an enormous, very expensive job here. The two organizations running rail are not really speaking to each other, as far as we can see. It's very difficult to get comment out of them. I'm doing another report on Southern African rail, more generally, and it's very difficult to get the South Africans to comment. Namibia, very helpful. Zambia, very helpful. Angola, you, there are people in place talking for all these countries. In South Africa, this is not the case. And the danger is we're going to be bypassed as a Southern African rail uh, entity, whereas we should have been uh, the leader. And I haven't even spoken about the corruption. So you can see that that has crippled, uh, crippled the railways in its own way. Just the... Corruption alone would have had an effect, but you add it to these other things, it's a disaster. So in the mini-budget, uh, the new finance minister uh, did announce, or certainly in the documentation accompanying it, that by the end of the first quarter next year, there will be third parties allowed to use the Transnet rail system. Yeah. Which sounds great on paper, but from what you've just said now, is there anything or is there sufficient infrastructure still to be used by the private sector. And indeed, if they start using it and nothing is being policed, is it sustainable? Well, if I'm, I might tell a little a story to illustrate how difficult this kind of thing is. In the Eastern Cape, there was a long branch line from Amabele, which is outside East London, to Umtata, the capital of the old Transkei. 280 kilometers long branch line which was very busy until the 1990s. It was closed, and the Eastern Cape government came up with a very good idea about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to reopen this line for passenger traffic and goods traffic. And there was a very good business case for this, get the people off the dangerous road, off the taxis and so on, and there was some goods traffic that they could take. And they reopened this line uh, in about 20. Uh, 09, 2010, at a cost of some 280 million rand. They had to rebuild the track, restore the infrastructure, uh, restore washaways and so on, because if a track, railway track is left for five or six years without maintenance, it's going to deteriorate. So it cost literally hundreds of millions of rand for them to open this, and the service resumed, but it was heavily subsidized. And they, the, the business model said, 
if we can get this going, eventually the passengers will come, the goods will come, and we'll be able to get this railway to pay for itself. All looked fantastic, and it actually started working. Passenger numbers went up, and so on. But Eastern Cape government ran out of money. And the period that they would continue to need to subsidize it for was lay ahead. So this railway has now closed. And it was a simple, simple task. Long line, but one line, and they simply had to restore it and get the trains running again. Now, if you look around South Africa, the number of branch lines that have uh, closed, the president, Cyril Ramaphosa, said, oh, we, we, we want to put out certain branch lines for, for tender, you know, for third-party um, cooperation and partnership. Well, the third party needs to see uh, an investment down the line getting a return. I mean, no one's going to go into this knowing and expecting to lose money. Third parties need to make a profit. They're not being nice about it. Investors need a return. And a lot of those railway lines will, will never reopen because the deterioration is such and the market has changed. For example, grain, the whole free state grain fields used to be served by railways very efficiently. And grain is a heavy, bulky product that should go on rail. Now, all those branch lines have closed due to some very funny accounting on the part of Transnet, who seemed to think it was their job to close lines rather than keep them open. It's a natural traffic for rail, and they should have kept it. And, of course, what do the grain farmers do in the co-ops and grain South Africa? They say, look, there's no. we're going to have to build new infrastructure to service road lorries. So the traffic has switched to road. Now, how do you get those farmers now to come back to rail and rebuild the infrastructure required for grain? It would take a very rich and kind third party to make that happen. So, I, I, you know, I, these, these talks about third parties, it's really got to be thought through and in greater detail. It sounds nice, as you say. In practice, when an organization infrastructure has deteriorated to such an extent, is it possible to pull it back in terms of market, customers, infrastructure, capital? Uh, it's going to be very difficult indeed. Including when you try and pull it back, like uh, Jose Matthews, uh, you get yourself suspended for your trouble, well, presumably, because well, we uh, you're pressing the wrong buttons. Well, we don't know what he's done or hasn't done. It's possible he has done something he shouldn't have done, but then why don't they tell us? And he's only been there six months. It's quite hard to make a, make a major mess in six months. You know, we see it down the line. If you don't, There's got to be a honeymoon period while he finds out where the levers are and so on. So this is very strange. And, and Alec, I think you made a point there which I haven't heard made before, is that uh, the media generally don't take an interest because it's not on their radar. It's not on the middle class radar. It's not on their reader's radar. And this is a major strategic sector which is being, has been run into the ground in some places. And no one's asking these questions. Uh, it's very difficult to get someone to answer the questions <laughs> in the first place, to get someone to respond to you. But I, don't see, I haven't seen anywhere where someone has said to the minister, so what's he done? What's he actually done? And if they have asked, we certainly haven't heard. Uh, and then you have to say, the boards, the boards of these organizations. Uh, what do they do? What are their qualifications? I mean, in governance terms, you go to King 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. A board should have a combination of relevant skills and experience for that particular uh, organization. And a lot of these boards, I think, don't know what questions to ask. They may be honest people. They may be well qualified. But are, have they been deployed there for other reasons? Uh, one, you know, it's very hard to, to attack individuals if they're trying to do a good job, but one gets the impression that boards are not asking the right questions either. 